after your music career, you can be like a pro dad joke. Take me to the pedal board. <laughs> Welcome back to Tap Tempo with me, Matt Lang. Thanks to everyone who came out to Costa Mesa last week. We did the birthday party thing, got to check out the OC Fair. It was a good time. Next week, I'm playing down in Dallas at the Nines. and That's on a Friday. And then the next night on Saturday, I'm in Orlando at the Married to the Rave Festival. This week on the show, I've got Trifonic. And Brian Trifon, he's an incredibly talented individual, lovely person. He writes really breathtakingly beautiful music. And I was first introduced to his music uh, right about the time I started working for BT. Brian is also a veteran of BT. You can hear his work all over this binary universe. And then a couple years after that, he put out his first album called Emergence, which is going on its 10-year anniversary uh, next year. One of the things I love about Brian's music is that he really sounds like nobody else. He's got his own thing, and he's always really remained true to his own artistic vision. It's something I really, really respect a lot. Aside from his own music, he also has a production company called Finishing Move, which he does with his partner Brian White, and they've been the composers on a bunch of the most recent Halo video games, which is pretty damn cool. So without further ado, here's Brian. Brian's drinking Topo Chico for the first time. Yes, I am. Thoughts? It's, it's it's actually pretty amazing. Like, yeah. I'm I'm a sparkling water connoisseur for sure. Right. And this has got that Gerald Steiner or Gerald Steiner bubble density, carbonation mm-hmm. density, but it also has a mineral water taste, like in the salt of Pellegrino. So <laughs> this is I'm down with this. Like I could I could get used to this. You describe that like you're a fucking sommelier of sparkling water. <laughs> Does that exist? Like, do, does that job exist? Because it could. I I could be that you, job. You could be that. Okay. You know, if the whole music thing starts to teeter off. Yep. Sparkling water all the way. Yeah, I like this because I, I could imagine doing sparkling water pairings. You know, like you have Topo Chico with you know your uh, your seared salmon, mm-hmm. but maybe you have a, a Pellegrino with um, your steak. I, I don't know things like that. I could I could figure this out. I already know your first task. Okay, what's that? Get Topo Chico at Trader Joe's. That is my first task. I'm going to do that. And then my second is to get an endorsement from Topo Chico. I feel like if you're working for them, you'd have all the Topo Chico you could ever desire. That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. But then you could send me cases of it. Absolutely. Because I can't find cases anywhere. I like have to buy them like single bottle at Sprouts. Really? Yeah, it's really wow, annoying. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, th- I'm gonna, I'm gonna hunt this th- down. I'm gonna figure out this, uh, this problem. They're like Seven Eleven sometimes have like liter and a half bottles with plastic and all that. Yeah, but I kind of like the the glass Coca Cola oh, bottle. Th- okay, this is actually like this is a serious rule. Like sparkling water has to be in glass. Like the I would the agree. the uh, plastic bottles. That's just no. That doesn't work for sparkling water. I have, mm-hmm. I have no problem with plastic bottles in general, other than yep. like the general environmental problem. But just in sure. terms of taste and whatnot. But for sparkling water, it, that does not work. Glass. Yes. Always glass. Yeah, absolutely. Does the Topo Chico translate to Trifonic ever? I guess not the Topo Chico. Well, I, I, it will. It will. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I, I'm new to this. This is my first one. Yeah, so. I've messed that one up. But but this this definitely does. I feel like uh, it, it has all the elements in that it's you know it's like a little bit refined, but it's also a little bit a little bit dirty. <laughs> it's got some. It's got some raunch. Yep. Yeah. Have you ever sampled any of your Gerald Steiner? I haven't yet. So, so I have sampled like sparkling water, um, yeah. uh, like just just twisting the cap and releasing the, the mm-hmm. carbonation. Mm-hmm. Um, like way back, actually, in two thousand seven, for yeah. emergence from the song Wise, like some of that percussion. There's actually like a little twist. There's a fizz. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's that, and. Um, I have a um, I have a soda stream like so you can make your own sparkling water because mm-hmm. I'm not even kidding about this sparkling water uh, fascination and I've, that makes some like pretty cool um, you know grinding sounds and some weird stuff so that's good I've idea. recorded that yeah 
What's the weirdest thing you've sampled? <laughs> um, That's semi PC. <laughs> 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 no, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing that bad. Uh, I'm trying to think the weirdest thing. I think. I mean, a lot of it is stuff that I didn't expect to sound cool that has sounded cool. Like, so for example, like the oven door, um, and it's the squeak that it makes. Mm. Um, and this is in my old apartment. Yeah. But it has a hinge, and you open it slowly, and it makes this long squeak, and it maintains pitch, you know, hmm. for a good long time while you do that. And so I've recorded that, and I've used that for years as really? like. A melodic sound and as like a pad sound, um, not only in the triphonic stuff, but in in the you know game projects and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's not that that's that weird, but it's it's been had the most unexpected and and sort of weird result. Right, right. Yeah, that's cool. Do you usually time stretch it, or or is it anything goes kind of? Uh, um, so yeah, so a lot of times something like that that's sustaining. Um, I'll usually have to time stretch it a little bit just yeah. so that I can get a crossfade loop that's long enough. Sure. Um, mainly though, it's usually I have to like pitch things, you know, yeah. where it's um, it will be like a, a, like a couple cents off where uh, you know it, it's annoying. Um, so I'll, I'll often like put things in Melodyne, pitch it, stretch it a little bit, but not enough where you get the whole Melodyne artifacts happening. So. You're probably the first person to ever melodyne an oven door. <laughs> so <laughs> Maybe. cheers to you. Thanks. Yeah. So I'll put that on my uh, resume. Yeah, yeah. Send that to Salamone. Yeah, exactly. You know. That's cool. So much of your work, you always, it has a very distinct sound. And thanks. There's definitely, I mean, you can hear it, everything, you know, even going back to TBU. Yeah. You know, you can hear. Your touch on everything, whether it's just you know the way you treat acoustic instruments within, I guess, a more synthetic world or whatever, but it's very unique. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that you know, in terms of like whether I want to or not, I have a sound for better and for worse. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, so like over the long term, that's been great. Cause oh yeah, of course. I've you know. Didn't have any problem. Like it was never like, oh, I need to find my voice. What, what am I doing? I, I never really had a choice. It was like, this is what I sound like. And and actually, like to give you an idea of that. So originally, um, when I first started Triphonic, and, and I was doing it with my brother, and this was like 2007, and we were working on Emergence. Like, I wanted to do music that sounded like TB, like the drum and bass of that time. Yeah. And that was my goal. And I tried really hard to rip him off. Realized and you couldn't. It, not even. <laughs> it just it just ended up my attempt to rip him off just ended up in a totally different yeah, direction. Of course. And and you know, now I fall into that same trap of uh all the time, whoever I get inspired by yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna rip this off or I'm gonna try to do something as cool. Crazy and wild is noisy, and it, and it never, it just ends up coming out triphonic, and that's and, the best place to be right <laughs> there. You I, know, I mean, and so you know, in some ways, it's great, and um, and and ultimately, it is certainly a, a blessing. Um, the downside is that some, sometimes it's like there's all these things that I, I want to be able to do and and make and sound like, um, but I'm not the sort of jack of all trades. Kind of uh, musician or producer, so it just yeah. it just ends up sounding like me, you know. Hey man, I'm like you. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I totally get it. Yeah. Did you know TB at personally at that point? No, no, no not at all. Yeah. Um, I was just like listening to his his records on repeat, yeah. and um, you know, and and also Calix as well, and just trying yeah. to figure out like, wow, how do they? How do they do that? You know, with yeah. like the drums and the bass, and mm-hmm. and because. It was sort of before that. I was really into Fotech, yeah. um, and I'm of course still am really into Fotech. But that was some of the first electronic music that sort of grabbed my heart and soul, right. you know. Um, and TB and Calyx, to an extent, are were like an extension of that Fotech music, mm-hmm. and it was more futuristic. And by that point, which is 
you know, the mid, early, mid 2000s, um, Fotech yeah. had already, he'd gone off in a different direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which was cool. It just was, just wasn't the same right. as, as what I was into at that, that sure. point. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it was, I was just trying to rip it off and I failed and ended up with something that, that is, uh, is what it is and, and, and I like it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. I remember it was anatomy. For me, I discovered anatomy when I was at Berkeley. Yeah, I still can't make those bass sounds. No, yeah, it's and I, <laughs> it's also it's just it's like the drums and it's just every, everything about it, you know. And and then <laughs> the cat scratching. I know. Um, everything about it just it just has a vibe and and it was uh yeah I don't know man it was it was like that was what I was really into at that time yeah. and and. Uh, yeah. So, but sometimes you know, failing is is a good thing. That's like that's how you can solidify your voice. You know, even even if you want to try to escape it, if you can't, then maybe it means you've just got to work on what you've got and push that further. Well, you know? it's certainly a lot more helpful ultimately than not failing. Absolutely, <laughs> you don't learn anything by succeeding. Really, that is absolutely true. So I kind of feel like you need to fail a yeah. hundred times and continuously. Yeah. Absolutely. How did you go about? Because the segue into this question is um, about a week ago. I got into not a Twitter battle, <laughs> but um, and this is my own fault for engaging. Yeah, but you know, I wanted attention. Anyway, um, there were a lot of questions came up. Whereas, uh, essentially, I posted this thing that Ryan Holiday had written. Uh, he's got this new book, Perennial Seller, mm-hmm. and um, the whole premise of just an excerpt of the thing was, you know, get off social media, yeah. just do the work. Yeah. Which, I mean, I think you and I are both on the same page as far as like, that's it, nothing else yeah. is really going to help you. But the natural backlash that I got was all, it was all pro social media. And <laughs> like, you know, but how else are we going to get discovered? How, you know, yeah. how else will we get validation for our work? Yeah. And so to lead in, so then how did you go from, Basically, you know, loving T's records to yeah. eventually getting to you know know him, and this wasn't social media. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of it was was basically just it was a different time, though. You know, yeah. like so that was back in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, yeah. and so my brother and I we worked on this record for an entire year. I had just moved, like I was working for BT before. I'd moved up from LA to the Bay Area, and um, put all this energy into it, and then you know we, we got it done, and we sent it out to a bunch of people, and just no one would listen. Like couldn't get anyone to listen. Yeah. It's the problem that everyone has, and um, people have now. Sure. And so you know, it was like the MySpace era, and so it was like there was not that much we could do, and so we just put it out. We started yeah. a record label and just put it out, and to like not much fanfare. Um, until literally two years later, where somehow it's like, you know, it started to spread. And, yeah. you know, um, Hybrid, they were into it. They mm-hmm. put out Parks on Fire on their uh, mix CD. Yeah, sound System. Yep. Yeah. Sound System 01. Uh-huh. And, and that sort of spread it around to a, a much bigger audience. And then, like, at some point, somewhere along the line, TB heard it and he got in touch. And then this was through social media because this is like 2010, you know? Yeah, sure. But, but he's like, you know, he posted it on his Facebook page and was like, this is awesome. And, you know, I, I was shitting my pants because it's like, yeah, wow, of course. Is, wow, it's like my hero. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it, it sort of spread that way um, by just a very organic, like other artists and producers mm-hmm. spreading it. Um, there wasn't much that I was able to do to leverage social media at that time. I think, you know, social media has its place now and it's just, it's a different world now. I think it's harder now than it was in 2007, 2008. I think so too. And the reason why is because like, it's even easier now to get started Mm -hmm. and to make decent sounding music. Exactly. Um, And it's more crowded than it was. Of course. Because, so, when I released Emergence, there there wasn't there wasn't EDM, there wasn't dubstep, like in a in a way that you know people in the U.S. had, had really heard about it much or right. anything. It was like 
chill out music. Mm-hmm. And and the problem of being typecast as chill out, which is so funny because that, is that even a thing anymore? Like you don't even hear about. But that was like the big yeah. deal, and in, in, in that era was was like chill out. Um, is like the Trifonic stuff was a little too intense to be chill out restaurant music, right? And but then it wasn't, you know, didn't have. It wasn't aggressive. It wasn't aggressive. It yeah. wasn't drum and bass, and it wasn't, you know, like house music or or trance mm-hmm. or breaks or anything. So it just was in this weird no man's land. But eventually, it, it somehow started to to get a a, a life of its own. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's like that was awesome. But I don't know how that happened. I don't know how to like replicate that in this day and age. You know, for someone that's new, that's trying to break through, you know? I, I don't know, it's really hard. I'm going to go out on a limb here uh-huh. and say it got noticed because it was really good. Well, thank you. As simple as that. Yeah. You know, I think ultimately, if you win over the producers, yeah, then they'll post it, they'll share it with their people just because they're into it. That is that is and true. That is true. You gain it, but you didn't do it by, you know, spamming, you know, TB's email box with listen to my record. No, you know, <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't. it was like you just put it out there and you let it be, and you yeah. let it be discovered. And that still, I think, is you know the best way to organically create yeah. some kind of following and I, let the work speak for itself. I totally agree. I mean, I think you have to create something that, first of all, is m- meaningful to you, and yeah. that is that you know. If I mean, if you're not sure it's good, but you know it represents you, and that it's something that is meaningful to you, and mm-hmm. if it's meaningful to you, and you put in the work with it, it will be meaningful to other people. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean that it will just necessarily become huge or grow into anything, but there will be a niche, and then you can take advantage of that niche, and like whether it's social media or mm-hmm. other producers, like. It will find some kind of following. You might not become Hardwell, but <laughs> it's like you know you don't necessarily need to be or want to be Hardwell. You just have to be you and 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 think about creating stuff that's meaningful to you. No, you know? and I think you know also when you bring up the guys like Hardwell and yeah, whatnot. Um, no, nothing wrong with Hardwell, no, by no, the way. No, yeah, no, no. I think like the reason why those guys are who they are is because that's what they lived for. Absolutely, you know like, they're not faking it. They are not. Yeah, they are the kings of that genre because that's truly what they believe in. Yes, I agree. So go with them, but then you can pick out the ones who don't. Yes, and that's always. I mean, you can tell entertaining. Yes, <laughs> you, you, you can tell when people um, when they're just they're trying too hard, you yeah. know, and like they don't have a voice, and I think that never. You can never get beyond mediocre if if that's the case. I think that the you know if you can tell when something's authentic and and that's that's honestly what i all I listen for in music mm-hmm. like i don't I don't care about the mix, I don't care about the production. I don't care if it's like stuff is out of tune. It's like if it has that vibe, if it has that essence mm-hmm. of you know that you can tell someone meant it and like yeah. their heart is into it, man, that's like. That's what makes it good, yeah. You know, and, and I've Absolutely. And, and and it's like that's following that has expanded my musical interests and world so much compared to when I was younger, where all I was listening for was, you know, it was like, oh, is this like really awesome tight thrash band, or is this like crazy IDM music or yeah. whatever? And and then over time, it was like more of like. It just keeps getting distilled down to like, well, is this have an essence to it? How does that, it make me feel? Yeah, yeah, and and it's like, does it like this person who's doing it? Does it rep, you know? Are they, they're really saying something? And, yeah. and sometimes that can be really rough around the edges, and it can be more profound than you know the most awesome mix or the like craziest production. I mean, and my favorite example to go back to is is like you know you listen to Joy Division records. Oh yeah, you sure. know before. They became New Order, and they barely knew how to play. Mm-hmm. And it's like out of tune and out of time. Yep. And the snare drum has a bunch of weird reverb on it. That's actually really cool. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it, it just—it's like it's really deep. It really has 
captures something. It, yeah. you know, um, and same with, I mean, that's why, like, my favorite band ever is probably The Cure. And really? It, yes, I absolutely. Didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah. The Cure. Um, Which album? I like Disintegration. That's, that's mine. Yeah. That's like classic. The title track in general kills me. Oh my god! Yeah. Yes, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Um. So you know, I, it's same thing with The Cure. It's like. Over time, they got a lot tighter and and better production, and everything. But mm-hmm. but early on, it was like a little rough around the edges. But it's just, man, it's like moving music, you yeah. know. And, oh yeah, and that's that's what matters. Mm-hmm. I think that's what matters, you know. Yeah, it's funny. I, in my own listener journey, what I've gravitated now to almost almost exclusively, not entirely, but substantially, it's pretty much just like singer songwriters. Yeah. Like acoustic guitar and a voice, totally. And I just—that's all I want to hear. I totally understand. I, it's funny. Like I find that I listen to like indie rock probably more than yeah. anything else. I'm kind of stuck in the past. It's like the 2006 era indie rock, like the first Band of Horses record. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that um, there's that Death Cab for Cutie album, and there's trans- transatlanticism, and the one that's after it. Plants. Are, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. That's just like epic. That's there's a Snow Patrol record from that time. There's actually two of them. The yeah. first two Snow Patrol records, like the Chasing Cars album. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know, just a lot of that stuff. Like, uh, and there there's all that like whole Omaha indie rock scene. Um, yeah, it's so. Who it, had where? Who was from Omaha? So there's this record label. Um, what is it called now? Now it's like I'm forgetting. Is it Barsuk or is that the wrong? Is that not? That's I, like I, don't know. I, I mean that is a label, but I'm not might be the one I'm thinking of. But the one with um, the bright eyes dude. Oh, um, and all his his Connor projects. Oberst, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then like there was a whole scene around like all of that kind of music and, and okay. That like a lot of that stuff means a lot to me. Yeah. Cat Power, I love. I love Cat Power. Yeah, it's it's you know she had a song called Metal Heart. <laughs> How fucking cool is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you know yeah. when I when I'm not listening to uh, Ingve Malmsteen, it's like I'm listening to Cat Power. So. I know. I I love your obsession with Ingve. <laughs> that really warms my heart. Well, there's so there's there's something to like beyond just. To some extent, I'm making fun of him because he's just like ridiculous, like Swedish shredder. That's you know, yeah, he's like a myth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like I also admire that he's a hundred percent embodies the attitude of like "fuck you," I'm gonna do what I want. Like yeah. this is my vision. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like he was doing his obnoxious neoclassical shredding in the mid nineties yep. when it was the most uncool thing ever. And he, and he dressed the same, he dressed yeah. like it's the eighties yeah. and he did not give one fuck. And I admire that so much. You know, I, I could never be like that, but it's just, just to see that like, he is him. He is like his authentic self. He is him 100% of the <laughs> yes. time. He's like, yeah. He's always got his yellow Strat and a Rolex in his Ferrari, which I don't know how he affords that stuff, but you know he rocks it, and I admire him because of that. I saw him. I yeah. saw him play uh, when I was at Berkeley. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. He did one how, of those. Like, how was it? I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things that you know, like I have a lot of respect for Ingve as yeah. you know, as far as being you know. A budding shredder and yeah, all that yeah. in my teenage years, but um, I think I was twenty. I mean, fuck, that was eleven years ago. Um, I was probably twenty when I went to go see him. Yeah, and he's a lot bigger now. Yes, you know he's older. <laughs> you but, mean physically or audience wise? Well, this was in college, yeah. so yeah, yeah, just physically. Yeah, the audience. <laughs> I know. I'm just I mean, kidding. given it was all you know, shred I'm guitarists in the crowd. So yeah. Like, the, the whole arena or whatever, the concert hall, Berkeley Performance Center. Yeah. Yeah, it was sold out yeah. naturally. But it was it was just the same song. Yeah. Five songs in a row. And like, you know, you'd have your main riff and the hook, but then he'd go into his neoclassical shred harmonic minor thing. Yeah. And it would just go on and on and on, then start spinning the guitar around his neck and, you know, doing yes. the kicks and yes. you know, which yeah. is amazing to see in like a five-minute-long YouTube video, right? 
But um, after half an hour, yeah, you're just like, I'm done with this. Like, I got my taste. I don't need any more. I saw him play on that like Generation X tour oh, uh, yeah. recently, like a year ago, and it was kind of the same thing where it was a little. He's just he comes out and he's already at ten. You know, yeah. he's turned up to ten and he's like playing as fast as he can and doing kicks yeah. and it's kind of like, dude, just chill, you know. And yeah, I think I think the problem with him. So first of all, let me say his first album I legitimately, legitimately really like, and I think like it's Rising Force. Yes, or, yeah. and it's I think it's beautiful music. Unfortunately, after that, I think most of his songs became a vehicle for like him to shred. Yes, and it's not about the song; it's not about the music. It's just about like this. This is like a ten, like this is like a, a foundation of which I can shred upon. Yep. And I think that concept actually can carry over a lot to electronic music. Like when you you know the sign of sort of immaturity when you hear stuff is like. And you hear it a lot, especially with people trying to do drum and bass. Is yeah. like, you know, it's like it's a vehicle for their resound yeah. and nothing else, or like just a vehicle for their sound design. Um, but the stuff that's really good, so like you know, like Noisia, for example, there's always something that's musical about it that's tasteful, even if it's just like two different notes that yeah. go because like so much of their music is taken up by the sound design, right? But it's always the musical elements that are there are exactly right, and they're mm-hmm. well thought out. And that's you know. what you'll remember, too, of their records. Yeah. Like, they make amazing bass lines, but that's not what you remember. Yeah, you, it's like you remember yeah. that the whole thing is good and the feeling that it yeah. has and, and all that. So it's like you know that yeah. mark of immaturity that I always listen for when I'm listening to new things is like, totally. you know, is this person comfortable in their production and in, in their music, or are they just making a vehicle to like show off their... Production chops or well, their sound design skills. You I mean, know? I think we're all guilty of that too. Oh, of course, you know? that's. Like, how, I mean, that's that's the road of development that you, just, everyone goes because you feel like you have something to prove. I mean, I yeah. if I listen to you know records I did ten years ago, I I just basically hear it as derivatives of you know Richard and Telephone and whoever that you know ilk. And I mean, I I understand. I know yeah. at the time, like they were in my mind the benchmark of. Right. What was you know the most amazing production in my head? So consequently, I had to be better than that, and I never was. Obviously, you know, like as far as what they do, they are the best of what they do because they just do what feels right to them. And when yeah. you're trying to be somebody else, it, it doesn't work. The good, I mean, you've always had. There's always been musical elements in your music as well. Like even if sure. it was like a lot of you know something to prove and like technical stuff. It you weren't like missing the musical element and the emotional element as well. You know, it's like you, it's. I think over time because I'm guilty of the same thing. Like I'm I sure. listen back to the to, to older things, and it's like, all right, maybe it didn't need some of this ear candy stuff that's in yeah. here, but you know, the music is what drives it, and it was like even the ear candy stuff, like a couple of things I could eliminate. It's like, they were always in service to the music. It wasn't overshadowing it. And I think that was true with, with your music, like the early stuff you did. It's like the, the music isn't overshadowed just by like, this is my technical, you know, show off. Right. You know, it's like, it, I think it's, it's well balanced, you know? Thank you. You're because welcome. Because when I hear it, I, <laughs> I can't, you yeah. know, I, I can't listen to that stuff, but I mean, like, can you listen to emergence? I can now. Yeah. Um yeah, it, it it's it's it took me like 3 years away from it. Yeah. Um I still feel like a little close to ninth wave and that's harder for me yeah. to listen to. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Em- Emergence like it reminds me of a time and um you know, I just I like the feeling of it because it has something that's uplifting about it. I mean, I try to do this in all the music, but mm-hmm. I mean, you you know me personally and I'm generally not like an uplifting kind of person. I, I tend to be anxious and a little bit pessimistic. I'm sort of like an awkward person. And so it's like in music, I like to express that a little bit of this uplifting thing that it, in some ways it's like it's for me. It's, right, of course. It's like the, yeah. what. It's like the comfort I want, the the way to make sense and control of the world that I feel anxious and concerned about, and don't feel like 
I quite fit into its. So I like that uplifting quality because it's like it comforts me, and right. I think other people pick up on that too. And it that's like what they get out of it more than any other, more than any production detail or any sound. It's like there's like there's a little bit of this hopefulness, and it's well balanced against the dark and sure like weirder elements and stuff. And and you know I feel like real life is less like that now. We're living in like some Trump world. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Not in California. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess so. Yeah, we are fortunately pretty isolated, minus you know the uh, the New York Times buzzes of death on my phone every day. That's true. But That's aside true. from that, pretty isolated. Yeah. But do you think it's maybe because you? I guess you apply that kind of the sunshine ray, <laughs> if you will, um, in your music only because you're not comfortable of kind of putting that out and real life so that's your outlet Um, for it yeah well I think it's not that I'm not comfortable with that in real life it's just it's it's harder for me to uh, express I think just emotions in general outwardly um, in the sense that like I I think I have like a layer between and actually it's helpful for music in some ways in that you know it's like like stuff happens, maybe I'll get angry, maybe something's upsetting, and I have a layer in between where I can just like it's sort of like a wall <laughs> that absorbs that, and then I can process it separately and analyze it, and then I deal with it over time and it mm-hmm. comes out. And right. the advantage of that is like it's good for things like negotiating with people or like having difficult conversations. Yeah, but Brian's white told me stories of when you <laughs> become the bad guy. <laughs> oh, I, I am the bad guy. I, I have to be because like I'm. I mean, not that I ever want to be, but sometimes, like you know, you, there's situations where you, you have to have tough conversations with people. Sure, yeah. And uh, not that I'm comfortable doing that, but I'm able to do it. Yeah. Um, but that same wall, like I feel like it allows me to think about my feelings and how to translate them, and you know, I don't know, express it musically. Um, and that hopeful element, it just I, I don't know. It's like it just it's something that, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm able to express that well in real life. But it's deep, deeper somewhere. I, I you know, I feel that. And, right. I mean, and it, like, and that's the world yeah. that I, I want to be. Like, I want to be a positive, optimistic person, even if I'm naturally like calibrated more on the pessimistic, mm-hmm. worried side of things. So it's 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 a way of of musically sort of taking control of, you know. Personal aspects that are um, that you know I, I can't control, right, right? Yeah. And then when you look back at the music you're doing now, um, and not not the game stuff, but like mm-hmm. your own personal music, yeah. As opposed to, well, even Ninth Wave, yeah. And then previously, how do you how do you think you've evolved? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think you know generally. I mean, and part of the reason it takes me a long time. It's not that I'm like all that slow at making music. I mean, as you know, I work on a lot of game projects, and those yeah. are all have tight deadlines, and I, I get it done, and it's all fine. But for the Trifonic stuff, where you know it's really, really personal, a lot of it's just like it's. I'm just not happy with it, mm-hmm. or I'm not. Sometimes it's like I'm not saying anything different, and so. Right. It's either I don't finish stuff or the stuff I finish I don't like and I just, you know, I keep doing more stuff until you know, I feel like I'm in a little bit of a different place and right. um and so I think between emergence and ninth wave there was a little bit less of a focus on like clicky sounds and more of this like mm-hmm. liquid liquidy sound this flowing that I was trying to get in ninth wave that um and like these metallic scrapey sounds and things like that, like my oven door. That's yeah, one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the main sounds that's a, a lot in, in Ninth Wave. Um, but it's still I wanted to connect. There's a feeling of like nature that's in emergence and Ninth Wave. I wanted to bring that out further mm-hmm. of of just the sense of of like the intertwinement of of nature and sort of the messy world around it. Yeah. Um, and I think with future things, it's the same thing, and it's just, um, yeah, it's some of the textures have changed a little bit, but I feel like I'm drawn more now to some of the like guitar-focused melodies and things that I had in Emergence, and that. Mm-hmm. so in the newer stuff I'm working on, there's definitely 
Um, it's sort of like the liquid and nature elements of Ninth Wave, and then there's it's definitely going back to more. There's like more guitars in there. That, yeah, um, yeah. So that's sort of where it's been heading. Yeah, I I find myself it's more guitar. Yeah, all the time, and then I got into guitar pedals, and uh, it's your roots, man. Right? I mean, it is. Yeah, you know, like as fun as a synth is or Pro Tools or anything like that. I I don't feel it. Yeah, you know, it's just another tool. But when I pick up a guitar and like a guitar and like a nice amp and a delay pedal, dude, heaven, heaven. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah, that's all well, you need because, in life. I mean, here's here's the bottom line. Like, I I don't know about you, but for me, like working on a computer, even though it's the best tool for the job, and I love the end result, like. It's not really fun no. most of the time. No, not at like all. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's not. Fun. It's work. Yes, yeah. it's it's work, and you're in front of a computer, like picking up a guitar and mm-hmm. you just playing something, like feeling the string between your fingertips, dude. Like, it's just like that's a feeling, man. That's yeah. that's like that's what I love about music. That's the first thing that mm-hmm. you know when I fell in love with music in like the. You know, where I was like, this is going to be my life is being like a 10 year old and playing guitar and just, and that's like, that's honestly some of the best memories of music that I Mm -hmm. ever have that I think I ever could have. Yeah. You know, Um, it's not like finishing some song where I'm like, wow, this is pretty good. Like, I'm stoked about this. Well, because you've been working on it for a fucking month straight. (laughs) So by the time it's over, it's like the excitement's gone. It's just, Thank fuck it's over. <laughs> yeah, and and not to say that it's not important. It's like deeply important. It um but it's just there's not the immediacy there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And like in guitar uh, or I'm sure any instrument that that you know somebody plays there's that immediate emotional release, the mm-hmm. the comfort of it and you know yeah. and, and so it's like yeah, that's I mean, that's that's why it's like I love going back to it. And of course, like then it's like you record it and then you spend like a hundred hours editing it. But, yeah, yeah, of course. But <laughs> you know that initial. Yeah, I mean, I think one of my favorite moments in my entire life was probably when I was like sixteen. Yeah, and it was when um, I played in basically like a hardcore, metal, punk, post rock, whatever band. Yeah, and playing those gigs where you'd be in, we were we were in New York, so. We're playing in like the squats of New York, and like where the rain would be coming through the ceiling, and it's kind of falling <laughs> down on you. And it's like four dollars yeah. on a Saturday for a matinee punk show, right? But just the sheer aggression of you know the singer like running around and screaming and everything, and like you have blood all over your <laughs> fucking pickups because you cut your fingers open on your strings because you were yeah. strumming so hard and so aggressively, and like that sheer feeling of being alive. Yeah, there are very few moments. Yeah, where and, I can you know relate and, that, and that's before it was like a profession too. And there's something yeah. about that that, that is changes like everything. The most magical, yeah. like it, for me, it's like the best musical moments ever. Was as a teenager mm-hmm. playing in like really terrible bands, playing yeah. really terrible shows. I played a show at no. I played a show at Noah's Bagels. Like, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> Noah like, shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Exactly. That, that's, <laughs> that, I like this good pun. You know, it's its own punishment. Uh, uh, uh. Um, but yeah, it's, punishment. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so but like that's one of the best memories I, I have of music, and yeah. I think it's important to you know like I try to keep that in perspective and remember that because you know it's like that's that's why I got into it, mm-hmm. you know, and it's another thing when you go pro and you make your living from from music, whether it's as an artist or you're working. As like an engineer or a composer or a sound designer or whatever, it's different. Yeah. You know, all all of a sudden, you know, you have a responsibility that's to other people. It's not just to express yourself; mm-hmm. it's to like serve, you know, the project. Yep. If if you're an artist, you have the demands of like your label or like what you can play in a club, and, right. and not that that all those limitations are bad. Like limitations are good. No, but they exist. But it, it's, they're going to color what you're doing. Yes, certainly. And and yeah. it's you know I think it takes away. Um, a little bit of the fun of it. That's not to say that it's not fun, but it's it's not it's never going to be like that, you know, well, teenage like, experience. Dude, it's like fucking heroin, you know, <laughs> we're like we're all trying to get that first hit again. Yeah. And but so when you're talking about I just had this thought and and so if you look at like your record like Emergence, let's look at Telephones uh Fahrenheit. Yeah. Um like early flashbulb records. I mean, I'm just pulling electronic names right yeah. now. Even like my first record, um, 
that's narcissistic. Anyway, <laughs> um, but it's a pattern. Yeah. And the first record is always kind of uplifting. Yeah. And there's a naivete and a playfulness in it. And you get to the second record, and that shit went dark. <laughs> and I, I feel like that, am I, I don't know, maybe it's because yeah. I'm, you know, that's a strong beer, but, <laughs> and it's gone, but fuck, man, like... Yeah, I mean, I think I think that well, it's always hard to follow up after the first thing because then you know it's a, a lot of the ideas or things that you might have been working on, at least in your mind, or like themes that you've been working on like your whole life. Basically, mm-hmm. you can put into that, and you, you know, there's a lot of time to refine it. And then usually the second, it's like you're trying to evolve past that and take it in a new direction and so you know that can make it go in a darker direction or but not worse i mean no no not not it not like uh, certainly the bands you know hit it big on their first record yeah they're yeah. fucked <laughs> yeah but i mean i think more in the underground scene it's like certainly like as much as all forever love fahrenheit fair enough yeah as an album yeah map is a way stronger album i agree yeah but it is a dark album yeah and look at hybrid with um a morning sci-fi or whatever. Morning, but before that was uh, there's wide, wide angle, angle. Yeah, right. yeah, and that was playful. And you know, yeah. like morning sci-fi, they started to get darker. Yeah, and then came I choose noise. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that was that to me is my favorite album by them. Yeah, like, I like I mean, all their stuff. I really like wide angle. Obviously, is like has a soft spot because like yeah. when I I heard that in two thousand or two thousand one, and yeah. that was before I was really into electronic music all that much. Mm-hmm. And I was like. This is amazing, you know. It makes sense because you're into drum and bass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was like a, that was my sort of way out of just drum and bass and into other things because mm-hmm. I was really at that time. Yeah, it's drum and bass. I liked Aphex Twin, like some of the IDM stuff, and I loved Bjork. Yeah. Um, and and Hybrid just sort of struck a balance of many of those things, you know. I I love Hybrid. Yeah. Like they're so hugely influential for me. Dude, me too. <laughs> me too. You still stay in touch with them? Yeah, Good. yeah. So, um, yeah, no. It's I it, like being part of that sound system. 01 was a really big deal, and I've I've stayed in touch sort of. Yeah. Ever since, um, and you know, like, dude, Mike, that's he's a talented, dude. Mike's amazing. Yeah, I love the two of them, Mike yeah. and Charlotte together. Yes, exactly. Just, the yeah, two of great. them together, they're like. Such a power couple of making amazing music for real. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they are. It's like the yeah. dream come true, you yeah. know. And yeah, and they live in like on a farm. <laughs> so, yeah, like, I know. I, I like I, I like follow their Instagrams, and it's yeah. like it's like farm life. I was like, that looks pretty awesome. Like yeah. that seems like the ideal life. Like you have rad studio. You've got like a peaceful, chill life. They're just you know spending time with their family, and their kids. You know, it's yeah. just. I don't know. It seems pretty good. I got a Christmas card from him this year with horses on it, <laughs> like their horses. Nice, yeah, yeah. It's like that's like, but fuck, uh, man. I you mean, can send them a Christmas card to your cats. I guess I know. I you know I should. Yeah, Charlotte trolls my Twitter sometimes <laughs> with my cat photos, but <laughs> so I guess they kind of get it in a way. Yeah, but. I mean that's kind of the best life right there in a way when you have your partner in the middle of fucking nowhere you get to do everything you want and you have your space. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, but then then the pessimistic side of me is like everything's always greener on the outside. There's there's the pluses well, of being in the Well, that's cuz they're in the fields. But Well, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> it's literally greener. I, yeah. God, I got to stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this is this is you're you're a pro. You're like you like it, after your music career you can be like a pro dad joke. <laughs> you can just do dad jokes and puns, you know, and then release albums of that. And like, sadly or um, oh. ironically, like that probably would get more royalties. That'll actually you, buy you, me a house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it won't be the actual music. It'll be the dad joke. You can have your album punishment, you know, with the like. I already have one called Punish Me. Well, there you go. I know. So this is like this is just. This would be called Punish You. Punish it would be, you. <laughs> be all dad jokes and puns. I'd buy it. No, I'll send you a promo copy. You, I'll just torn it. It's all yeah, good. Yeah, I know. I mean, come on. Oh, God. When's your next album coming? Oh, that's a good question. Um, next question. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so... I have a bunch of things in progress that I actually do like, so that's that's encouraging. Um, 
I don't know. I don't want to like give a date because yeah, yeah. I don't want to not stick to it. Yeah. But what is happening for sure is there is going to be a tenth ten year anniversary of Emergence. Yes. Which I believe that you're doing a remix. Of. I am. Yeah, and I've got a lot of other awesome people doing remixes for that. Um, and I'm hoping. I don't want to make a promise, but I'm hoping for a vinyl release uh, for that because there's been a lot of requests for Emergence on vinyl and. You should do it. Um, so I'm going to try to do that. Um, if it's not cost prohibitive, but I think it will work. So, um, yeah, yeah. Th- so that that's definitely happening. That's going to be next year, early next year, um, and then hopefully there will be other things uh, that new music as as well, um, um, yeah. either before or, or after that. Um, and yeah, because there are there's some things that I've got together that I do really like, and it's not done yet. Um, but that's how it goes. I try yeah. to like make stuff that can last like at least five years. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the people that listen to my music are very patient, but the good thing is like, even when I listen back to things and, and this is not to, to toot my own horn, but I'm like, you know, this still like not everything holds up, but it mostly holds up pretty well, you know? Um, and, and that's, I do try to go for that. Like I've not, it's like, for example, like on the new stuff, I'm not doing like an album of trap beats because by the time that it's out, and then secondly, by that the time over. five Are years, yeah. yeah, it's like that's not, you know, and same thing with Ninth Wave. It wasn't like this is dubstep 2012, you know, because no. it's like I knew that that was going to be over. It's like I try to steal the things that I like from all that and incorporate it mm-hmm. uh, as best as best I can. Um, but stay away from stuff that's like too much of the moment that's going to like lock it into that period of time. Um, because I'm, t- I'm just slow making albums. So I want them to last. I don't want yeah, them. Yeah, But you've never been that kind of guy either. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't chase the trends. I no. I actually do stay really up on it. Like I listen to music constantly. I consume music constantly and stay up on like what, what are people doing? And how like, do you do that? Like, what are you? How Spotify in, yeah. in general? Like, it's like top fifty charts or whatever? Or? Um, I just I dig deep. So, like, okay. what I'll do is I'll um, go like look on different blogs um, and just like read about stuff, and then I'll listen to it. And if there's things I like, then I look at related stuff and go to that. I'll mm-hmm. check out playlists. Um, generally, it's not the top fifty stuff that I'm interested in. I, I I'm interested in the more weirder stuff, but that's the only one I know. <laughs> yeah, no, but Spotify has some great playlists. There's one that's called like Fresh Finds Cyclone, and it's like a Spotify playlist, and they update right. it every Wednesday, and it's all like pretty weird music. And I've discovered a lot of good stuff on that. Um, and uh, oh yeah, thanks, man. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've discovered a lot of good music on that, um, and. Yeah, there's there's actually like there's there's another blog that I look for for stuff. There's it's called nodata.tv and it's actually like some illegal download That sounds site. like some torrent shit. It's yeah. not torrents like they have like, you know, like mega upload download links. But I don't I don't I mean, I don't even bother. I just go like it's really well curated. So what I'll do is I'll just look stuff up on there and then listen to it on Spotify cuz right. you know. It's easier. I'm a premium Spotify payer and and it's easier. So No, it's way easier. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I don't want and you know, it's like if I'm going to download something, I'm going to buy it. You know, if I'm going to stream it, I'll just stream it. So Yeah. Um I don't need to like but but that site even though it's like some kind of illegal site, is actually very well curated. Um, and it has some weird stuff. That's why I like it. It's like, you know, there's maybe six out of 10 is kind of like, I'm just like, no, I'm not into this. But I believe it. Four out of those 10 are I mean, like, shit, man. I discovered cool. Burial in, you know, 2006 or whatever because of one of those sites. Me too. Certainly. I, I discovered Burial through, oh, what's that record site? Boomcat. No shit. Yeah, in fucking 2005. Oh, like, man, you were early. Boom, yeah, I, sh- I remember I showed the first Burial album to BT. Oh, and it was because, it, you know, that's when I was working for him yeah, back yeah, then. Yeah. And I was like, dude, this is the future. Like, this is the most amazing album. 
And he's like, what is this? <laughs> get, he, he didn't yeah. get it at that time. Yeah, so, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was funny, though. I just remember. But yeah, man, that Boomcat, I guess, is another. I, I haven't looked at that site. And, and that reminds me, I should check back there and see if there's anything else. Oh, so. I remember like the 30-second previews. Yeah, for sure. And they have beeps in it, like because they don't want you to yep. to yep. rip it. Mm-hmm. So they'll put in like a beeping sound, which is just yep. ridiculous. But whatever. Oh, I remember. What do you think your biggest takeaway from the whole BT experience was? That's that's tough. I mean, BT experience was really important because um, yeah, yeah, it was the first thing right out of right out of college basically and I, I interned for a year while I was in college for him um, and you know I looked up to him a lot because he's a talented dude he's very charismatic and yep. you know as much as he can sometimes be his own worst enemy and a difficult person like you can't ignore what he actually did for like trance music in the the mid '90s, like no. br- bringing in the sort of the musicality and and you know the piano and stuff. And even though like you can listen to it now and it sounds dated, but you know at that time like no, it, he was one of the first classically trained musicians to do it. Yeah, certainly. So yeah. it it was you know a big uh, a big deal. But I think one of the you know the things that was hard is that like over time you know there was definitely differences and he's a can be a challenging person to work mm-hmm. with at the same time like we also got along really well which makes it hard cuz i think you know um it he, gets confusing yeah it gets confusing yeah. and so i guess the biggest takeaway is i, I learned a lot about myself mm-hmm. and like and also about the type of person i want to be and the type of person i don't want to be and like the type of decisions i want to make versus not so it's like the first real lesson in like being an adult and mm-hmm. trying to be a good adult and also knowing that you know just people are people are flawed i think i do yeah. believe he's was trying to be the best person that he can be and that he he was you know doing the best he can um and you know yeah and also at that time too i was like young and <laughs> naive as well and also like a little bit you know i Things are just different when you're in different places of life. Totally. So yeah. yeah, but I learned about being an adult. I think and 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 that was that Did, was an, a, a pivotal, important experience to have. Yeah, I mean, how, how do what do you think? Like, what about for you? Actually, what you were saying was very similar to how I feel. Yeah, um, certainly life lessons about how to be an adult, yeah. how to treat people who you want to be and who you don't want to be as a person. Yeah, um, that was certainly for me the biggest takeaway. It wasn't. I mean, of course, there's the music stuff and yeah. you know certain techniques sure. that we both, I'm sure, use to this day. Sure. Because once you've time corrected a drum loop a hundred <laughs> fucking times, you can never not do it. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was um, it was a wake up call. Yeah. You know, and I I do feel like I aged ten years in one year <laughs> by doing that. And yeah. Um, and as you know, as challenging as it was, I'm forever grateful I yeah. had that opportunity because I wouldn't do what I'm doing now had I not. Yeah, no, me, me too. It was like you know, um, and like there was a lot of good. There was good times too that you know that I yeah. enjoyed. That was like that was fun, even though it was like you know it was a hard work. Like, and that was that was I guess the other good lesson of it was like to learn in your early twenties. How to work really, yeah. really hard, like twenty four seven work, um, because you can't keep that pace forever. Nope. Like I don't work that hard now, not because I'm lazier, but just because it's like I'll die. You yeah, know? But, <laughs> you know, so so it's just you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But totally. you want to learn like what what does discipline mean? What does hard work mean? Especially yeah. when you're younger, because if you if you're not able to do that, like you, have, I don't think you have a chance. You know what I mean? Like in music, if you if you can't like if you don't know how to put in the work, I, I think it's just it's really impossible, and it gets harder as you get older because you, you literally can't because you can't stay up late and get up early no. and and be a healthy person and live you know past forty and and like the goal is you know of any of this stuff like beyond music is to to have like a good life that's meaningful and that means like. Being meaningful and being 
good to the people that are in your life. Um, yeah. They matter like a million times more than you know your beat. Doesn't mean you don't need to perfect your beat and get your snare drum right or whatever it is and spend a million hours on it. You do, but like you also have to eventually carve out a life too because it's way more important and it's like your music doesn't mean shit, you know, if your if your life is not together at all, you know. Yeah. Um so, yeah. Get your shit together. No, it's so true. <laughs> what do you think your favorite moment if you have a favorite moment of that experience was for you? So, I think I mean, so one of them was like we played at the Hollywood Bowl, like for uh, the Spanner Universe. Oh like, shit! You got to opening, do that? yeah. Oh fuck, that's o- cool. Opening uh, for that video games live in like whatever 2006 or 2007 yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. 2006, I think. And um, it's just playing two songs from uh, the Spanner Universe. You were but, playing guitar on that, right? Yeah, yeah. And I had like a Variax, so I could like change the tuning with the yeah. dial. It was that was pretty sick, and and especially because cool. you know so my mom was there in the audience and that was like at that time. So she lived up in Northern California yeah. and she was sick. Like she had been, well, I mean, she was better at that time, but she had had colon cancer oh, sure. and had like, you know, um, you know, side effects from the treatment of that. I mean, she was, she's fine. She's in remission. She still is. She's doing great. But uh, at that time it was like, you know, a little uncertain of what was happening. Yeah. And so, you know, like she came down to it and was like so stoked, you know, to to be there and see it, and because they have those like big screens that, yeah, yeah you yeah. know, and so just to like have your, you know, in this case, like have my mom see that, yeah, uh, was that made it sort of That's I think special. the most special moment for That's sure. Really special, yeah, certainly, yeah. Wow, mine's different. What's yours? What's your most special moment? It wasn't on the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> um. At least this is the one I think I look back on most fondly. Mm-hmm. And Mike DiMattia came to us for a week. Oh, nice. And uh, Love Mike. Yeah. And so Mike used to work for BT also. Yeah. And so he came down. He was doing all the vocal editing on these cool. helpful machines. And so he came down, and I think he was there for a week. And the second day he was there... I drove him to the liquor store. Uh-huh. He bought a case of forties <laughs> and brought wow. him back to what the is house. This, Cypress Hill. <laughs> and, and every you know, at the time, you know, every day he'd just be like sitting behind me in the studio with a forty in hand. Nice. And that to me was that's just there was a joy in that. Yeah. You know? and, no, and Mike actually brings that out. Like one of the yeah. things I really miss Mike, like because that was I think. He's the one who taught me a lot, like because yeah. you know when I was working for BT for most of the time I was there, Mike was there. Um, yeah, and he's the one that taught me a lot of like how to do things, also how to be disciplined, how to be organized. Mm-hmm. You know, just a lot of the basic stuff that are important skills, like not only in music but in everything. Um, yeah, and so. Yeah, and he just like he has a great energy about him. He's like you know, like oh, just I mean, yeah. So so yeah, I I have so many good memories with. Mike, oh yeah, for I mean, sure. I don't think I would have survived that as unscathed so I came out, which wasn't very unscathed. <laughs> but I don't think I would have had it not been for Mike and for yeah. you also because huh. you are both you know huge support systems. Because I was down there completely on my own in the yeah. middle of the fucking woods. I know, I know. So yeah. <laughs> that was, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, for that, I'm definitely hugely indebted to you both, like forever. But bonded. Yeah, man. No, it's, it's like a trip. It's a lifetime bond. <laughs> I know. It's funny, man. Like, yeah. I think about that. And, you know, the uh, the little army. Yeah. And. No. You know, one thing that was he was good at was finding good people. Like he you picked know. amazing people. Yeah, and that's that's like that's actually hard to do. It's that hard is. to it's a really hard to find good people. Um, he's a smart guy. Oh yeah, he's really intuitive. You know, he's incredibly talented. Yeah, he knows. I, even if you look at it more in like the traditional role, the producer. Yeah, he knows what he can get out of people. Absolutely. So, yeah. no, I mean, it makes sense. He had a good team around him. Definitely. Always. Yeah. And and that was always the most fun part. It's like the team, you know, and doing stuff as a team. Like, that's one of the things. I'm so that, jealous. Like, <laughs> you know, um, I like 
I mean, I love working with other people. I always usually try to be part of a team. Um, Trifonic nowadays is mainly me. My brother just handles the business. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I miss the days of like working with him just because it's it's fun. It's fun to bounce ideas off somebody, yeah. and and so it's and that's something that like I'm sure a lot of producers can identify with is like just. It's like doing stuff just alone, and it's like it's hard. It's hard sometimes. It's hard, and you lose perspective. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's like you need to have support, like friends, and and like go outside mm-hmm. each day, and, and like 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 it's stuff that you have to like keep track of. Like I, I make sure yeah. to go outside every day, <laughs> like whether it's just for a walk or go for a run or get a yeah. coffee or something. But you know, um, just it's see humanity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like next on my list is like. I want to see spend time with people like face to face because mm-hmm. I, I my world got really small of, of right. you know well, yeah I mean I guess and everyone I mean you just got down here from San Fran yes and I did. like Brian literally moved here two weeks ago yeah and Brian White oh, I say Brian White just because there's a lot of Brians that are in this yeah but Brian yeah. Trifon literally moved down here two oh, weeks yes. ago oh <laughs> yes I, yes okay I'm sorry yeah and I'm saying um, Brian White my business partner for for a finishing move he moved down like the end of last year but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just moved two weeks ago yeah yeah you're down or a week ago actually it's only been a week That's, oh shit yeah I moved uh, not this past Saturday but the Saturday before so yeah what like day a, is it? Monday so right. like like a couple like 10 days or something oh my god yeah what prompted it so, just work. Yeah, a lot of most yeah. of it's work. Like I think to do music stuff and scoring and things, it's important to live in a major music city. Yeah. Um, and so many of the people that we work with are in LA. Also, some of the people that make decisions about stuff, whether it's in video games or mm-hmm. film, TV, yeah, business side, it's, it's all like, here. They're all here, yeah. and and I want to push that further. And well, being like, like you said, you want to have the face to face. Yes, yeah. and being in the Bay Area was a little bit of a minus. It's yeah. equally, it's actually a little more expensive up there. So definitely more expensive. Yeah, so it's you know it's a move that I had to make, but it's it's hard too because like you know my fiance she hasn't moved yet. Like right. it might not be for several months. Um, you know, yeah, that's and tough. It's uh, you know, so it's and moving is like is a pain in the ass. Moving mm-hmm. a studio and a bunch of gear, you know, it's like yeah, it's a real pain in the ass, and it's it's a it's stressful to move. So, um, but I'm stoked to be here, and like yeah. I, I'm really excited about the future. So that's all, I love you're just down the street. <laughs> just, yeah, you know, yeah, dude, crazy Atwater village. Yeah, God, that's so weird. Yeah, I love that man. That's awesome. And then like. Your partner is literally a half mile away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian White's in Eagle Rock or whatever. Yeah, he's so. in Eagle Rock. Yeah. yeah, we're in Highland Park here. Yeah, so it's it's cool. It's like my yeah. whole fam right here, dude. I love the community on this side of town. Yeah, I mean, you know who else is out here too? So it's lots of peeps. Yeah, it's just it's great. It's I feel at this point this is where all the artists live. Yeah, and like the artist artists. Yeah, the people actually doing the work. Yeah, and that. I feel it. I feel just like when I'm walking down York, you know, going to get a cup of coffee at like Cafe de Leche or whatever. You know, yeah. there is, you know, the people around you are into something. I was wearing a fucking make noise shirt one day <laughs> when I go into like, and the barista, dude, I got a fucking no coast at home. I was like, like, wow, really? Uh, what days do you work so I know not to come here? No, <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those. You know, it was a nice moment. Yeah. No, oh, that's that's awesome. I mean, and well, that also speaks to like how big modular has gotten too. It's crazy. It's like it's not like some basement stuff anymore. It's no, it is. It's mainstream. It, it, it's, it's big. Wild. It's a big business, um, yeah. and it's still pretty niche, which is funny. But it's a very very dedicated user group. Yeah. Oh yeah. And there are some tools coming out in there that you won't find anywhere else. Yeah, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna have to dive into that. When you do, let me know. I, I will absolutely. Because um, there's there's a lot of snake oil. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a lot of shit that doesn't matter. But um, because I would say a solid eighty percent of modular is just collectors, right? And there's a lot of development that isn't necessarily the most exciting, but you know they know it will sell and people buy it. 
and it's expensive. Yeah, it is. You know, it's a collector's yeah. market. This isn't, you know, your guy who's slinging fucking guitars at Guitar Center. He's not bu- he's not building modular anytime yeah. soon. But there there's really some amazing technology out there. Oh, I I agree. It's like it's I definitely it's something I want to get into and I also I like the community. It reminds yeah. me of like heavy metal community like prior to 2000 new metal. Mm-hmm. Not new metal. Nothing against new metal. Well, actually, I, yes, I know what you're talking metal, about, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like there's like this camaraderie and like you know, it's just like people are really into it. It's not like like people dedicate their mm-hmm. life to it. Like our friend Bryce, who's yeah. like yeah, he exactly. lives for modular. He and, does, and there's like there's yeah. a lot of other people like that too, and that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Like that you know, there's that speaks to like the depth of what's there. As well, you know, I mean, it's like that—that that it can get that level of loyalty and interest and excitement. You know, there's a competitiveness in though too. Oh, yeah. which is interesting. Like there are, it's interesting to see because there are uh, like unspoken battles. Yeah. And so I, this is news to me. I don't. I don't know about this stuff. Well, just you know, they're egos. Yeah. You know, and some companies get big really quickly, and then others takes time. Others take time, but you know, some are just doing it for the love. Some are doing it because they can. Yeah, there's a whole gamut of anything that can happen. But um, Game of Thrones kind of situation. Yeah, basically, a I, little bit. I wish there's some pun I could come up with. I was trying to think of that right I now. Just, like Game of all this Topo Chico is <laughs> slowing down my brain. I, I know it, it's really messing you up. Yeah, but um, no, was, you know what I got really into recently too is um. And it's bizarre because they all are in like the same area. It's all the Midwestern pedal builders, huh? Like Dwarfcraft and Chase Bliss Audio and uh, Dun Effect. Like they're all in like the middle of America, and they're all making these, you know, mostly handmade guitar pedals. That's awesome, I- and it's amazing because they're just down. They're just nice people, like trying to get by at the same time. So. It- it kind of makes sense. Like I, I'm actually, I wonder if they're in the Midwest because, like, I bet the margins are really tight making pedals. I'm sure it's it is. Re- probably really hard. Like you, it's probably very hard to do in California. So it seems. I think like, most of them are from there, also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I don't. I think because it seems to be mostly like the northern part of the Midwest too, like Wisconsin that yeah. area. Yeah, I see. But uh, Minnesota. So I think also a lot of it it gets really fucking cold in the winter, right? And so what are you going to do? You're going to stay in your basement and you're <laughs> going to like build the weirdest fuzz you've ever heard in your life. That makes sense. Yeah, like, and you come out a little bit weirder as a person after, and that's probably a good thing. So okay, so what what's the best like boutique distortion pedal that that's out there or that your favorite at the moment? Because like uh, pedals is something that I used to have a lot of guitar pedals, but yeah. I want to get more. And that's an easier stepping stone, even than modular, you know, to dive into. My favorite distortion, yeah, is the Dwarfcraft Eau Claire Thunder. Okay, um, I have it. I'll show it to you. All right. After oh, great. Um, there's also the Necromancer, which is really fun because that has this really um, very intense three band EQ on it. Yeah, but it's not as gritty as the Eau Claire. The Eau Claire has this thing that is just. It's kind of big, muffy, but supercharged. Yeah. Um, and then I just bought the uh, the Chase Bliss Audio Tonal Recall, hmm. which is a great name. Yeah. Um, and it, I got really into it because I was looking for uh, basically a MIDI syncable analog delay. I see. And he made one. That's awesome. And so I started listening to all the demos, and the demos were like beautifully made. It was you know outsourced to was like a third party guy, but it was just like here's the sound of the delay. Here are some plants in a fucking cupcake tin. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of those things, but yeah. but the sound of it was like oh, like okay, this is the thing. Yeah, uh huh. Nice. I get it. So um, there's that. But yeah, no, we'll. I'll take you to the pedal board after because there's some fun shit in there. Take me to the pedal board. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh my god! There's yeah. I just ordered a new board so I can get thee to a pedal board. No, yeah, I no, I don't. that uh, Shakespeare I'll... doesn't work. Never no, mind. but it's gonna be a pedal board of. Um, I think I should just name it the pedal board of pain. 
Nice. Because it's just going to be nothing but distortion and fuzz for yeah. the most part on that side of it. Nice. Yeah. No, I, I, I think the thing with, with pedals and also with m- modules as well, it's like the one thing that I think plugins have a really hard time with is distortion. Like that's, yeah. that's like, that's not like where it's, it's like out of control, but controlled. Like I think pedals can get. They're very can, utilitarian. Yeah. They don't have a lot of character. Yeah, or or it's like a lot of work to get the character, yeah. or it's like a narrow range where it sounds good, and then you go beyond that and it sounds like shit. Yeah. Um. So I, I think with with pedals and modules, like sometimes you can get, I mean, you can get wild distortions and things like that, but it's just there's there's character to it. There's a vibe. Um, I mean, like so one thing that I have that I really love that's is the Sherman filter bank. Oh yeah, and that's essentially that's kind of like a distortion pedal. It's it's just it's not like a it's wild. It's not like a Moog yeah. filter where it's like clean and nice. It's just no. it's it's chaos, um, yeah. and it just does crazy stuff. But it always still even when at its most extreme, it's not like piercing in a bad way it's it's just it's aggressive and it's fuzzy and it's unpredictable and, yeah. and i like that and that's like the way a good module or pedal is you know yeah yeah it's fun shit so i put out that thing you know let's ask you a couple of questions oh okay yeah so oh fuck you iphone update i do not want to update you want to update right now i never want to update 10 point 10 point 10 ever but um, we actually we got a couple good ones. Maybe actually a new one came in while nope, just retweets. Nope. Anyway, how do I do this thing? I go and mentions. So here's a good one. It's from my buddy Andrew. Uh, what are the top three things you can't live without? Like just anything in life, I guess, or or does that mean music stuff? He left it pretty vague, so yeah. I'm gonna leave how you want to answer that up to you. All right. Well, so definitely. I think food, and and I don't mean this in a joking way. Like I really love and appreciate food more than I love music. I love food, like and and that is one of the benefits of living in California. Even though you pay a lot to live here, the the food both in Northern California and in LA is fantastic. Cal- it's so good, except pizza and bagels. <laughs> that's and, true, and rare meat. Okay, I'll, I'll give you those things. That's that's, that's true. That's I, New York. I I agree with that, but the rest of it is 100 percent California. Yeah, yeah, it's like there's like so food couldn't live without that. Um, I think, and this is like so generic, but like music, like it. I mean, but it means the fucking world to me. It really yeah. does, and I wouldn't be here without it for sure. You know, and and it's uh, and for me, it's like discovering new music, and it's just like that's still my favorite thing. Is like. Is like searching for hours and finding something that I'm like, wow, this is great. And yep. and sometimes when you find something that's amazing, like like burial, like his, his untrue album, like I, that brings me pleasure for like mm-hmm. decades. Oh, I know. You know, I mean, like untrue came out in 2007. I mean, I've been listening to that for 10 years. I've listened to it thousands of times. I'm not tired of it. It's yep. And, and there's so many other albums like that 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 you know. Um, so that that would be the second would be music, which is super generic. But third thing, um, again, this is just like some basic bitch Starbucks, uh, not Starbucks, but people. Like obviously the people in my life. Like that's those are the things uh, you know that that's what's important. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and over time, I think that everybody learns that lesson. You know, yeah. it's like it. I think when you're younger. You're more into yourself. I, I'm still I agree with that. Yeah. Still very much into myself. I'm sure too much so, but it's like it's become more that you know. I realize the importance of like like you know family and and the friend, older I get, the more friends. important family becomes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, yeah. The, those are those are the three things. That'll take. I got two more, and I'm saving sure. the best one for last. Okay, great. But. Uh, Transputer from Twitter wanted to know how do you start your tracks? Beats, chord progression, vocals. Hmm. Yeah. So usually it's I'd say it's like a, it's chord progression or I mean it depends. Sometimes it's like just a single sound that's inspiring. Yeah. You know. Um. And then I'll build around that and like try to just create a vibe. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of times I like to just 
it's like could really be anything. Yeah, it's like yeah. I like to create the setting like you would yeah. if you were writing a, a story. Yeah. Like you think of like what is the setting for this, mm-hmm. and so I create that. A lot of times that's textures. Um, yeah. So and it's usually never beats first because like beats are not my strongest point. So it's like I, that tends to be like uh, like I'll figure out textures and some kind of melody, and then often I figure a beat that works for those things instead right. of like. Oh, I'm going to come up with this rad beat by itself. Like, I have a hard time coming up with beats out of context. Like, a lot of people do that, and it seems like actually, a, if I could do that, I would because it's it's for mixing. It's easier to build around a beat. Um, yeah, totally. But yeah, so so usually textures. And- All right. Lastly, yeah, and uh, I don't know if you saw this, but this is a wonderful question. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's from Dan Gillespie over at Eventide. Oh, oh, nice. And yes. he wants to know. Oh, I did see this one. Yeah, what you gonna do with all that ass? All that ass inside them jeans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will let Will I Am decide what to do with that. So I'll leave it up to him. You think he'll know? Uh, uh, yes, I do. I think. I think he. I think I'm a little scared. Actually, I shouldn't maybe leave it up to him. But you know. Whatever, I'll take my chances. That was Trifonic. Go check out his albums Emergence and The Ninth Wave, and do keep an eye out for the 10-year anniversary of Emergence coming out early next year. See ya.